Good morning and welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. Stand with us as we sing. Creation rise and sing. Oh, all you angels sing. Every nation sing. Each generation sing. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful. Cannot be moved. Be refreshed from the wells of salvation. Give thanks. He is good. His mercy endures. Sing, sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. It's so good to have you here with us this morning. A little rain won't keep good Christians away. and We're glad you made it out here. We have visitors all the way from Houston, Texas and other places. If you're a first timer, I hope uh, you got one of the visitors cards when you came in. You'll fill that out and drop it in the offering plate later on so we can have a record of your attendance. We thank you for being here. We always look forward to seeing new faces every Sunday morning and as you, those of you who are regulars every Sunday, God bless you because you're the people who make it possible for us to be here and we just thank you so much for your faithfulness. Uh, there's some people here who helped Naomi Ornelas move from somewhere over in Sachilia to Aviano yesterday. I think you guys should stand up and take a bow. I don't know how many of you were here, but a few. There you go. God bless you. There were others. They're just outside the sanctuary right now, but uh, that's a great thing, the family of God coming together to help out a member, uh, her husband's deployed, and she had to move her entire household, and those guys chipped in and did the work. I was, I was on standby. I was on the bench, ready to be called into the game anytime, but no one called me, and I was so disappointed. You know, I'm one of those guys who just loves work, and I was thinking I might get a chance to sit and watch it for an hour or two yesterday, but they didn't call me. Uh, Adele and... Yeah. That was the best move I think I've ever seen. Well, Hallelujah. That's great. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. People know how to get things done, and, that's, and they're willing to do it. That's great. The new flower arrangement over there for Easter, Adele and Amanda Lozano did that, so thank them for the flowers and pray they stay alive at least until Easter Sunday. Uh, 
I think Adelie's kind of expecting me to take care of them this coming week, which means they don't have much of a chance of living, but if you'll pray. <laughs> Next Saturday, right here at the church, men's breakfast, our monthly men's breakfast and Bible study will happen at 9 o'clock. Now, if you only want to eat, you come at 9. If you want to help with the cooking, you come at 8.30. And we do pray that somebody will always come at 8.30 because we like to have hot food for breakfast. So 8.30 and then the, the Bible study and, and thing starts at 9. You come at 9 to eat. And then right after that, we're going to pitch into a uh, partial work day here at the church. You know, Easter is coming and Easter Sunday, we almost always see people we don't see routinely through the year. We want to really look good and have our building looking its best. So there'll be some work going on on the next Saturday. We invite you to come, bring your innovative ideas and your muscle power to help us just do some general spring cleaning, so to speak, to get ready for Easter Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, because uh, the first Sunday in April is, a, is Easter Sunday, we're not going to have newcomers orientation on Easter Sunday, so we'll have newcomers orientation next Sunday at 10 o'clock, uh, meet here in the sanctuary, we'll go from here. Uh, this is for people who are new in the area, who don't know much about Aviana Baptist Church. You've got questions you want to ask. You want to just kind of hear about who we are. You come at 10 o'clock. There will be some uh, continental-style, you know, Italian-style breakfast and coffee for you. And uh, we'll give you a, a good orientation as to what Aviana Baptist Church is all about. Now, you are going to remember, I, I noticed the Armed Forces Network is even trying to help me with this. Next Saturday night, before you lay your heads on your pillow, you're going to spring your clock forward one hour. Because if you don't do that, on the next Sunday morning, you're going to meet us as we're leaving church. You're going to be coming in. We're going to shake hands and we tell you how sorry we are you missed church. <laughs> so spring that clock ahead one hour next Saturday night before you go to bed. Now, the schedule for Easter Sunday, we're making it very public so everyone can know. Those who are interested in having a sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E experience, come to church at 8.30 on Easter Sunday morning. We'll be here in the sanctuary for about half an hour. At 9 o'clock, we'll go downstairs for breakfast and fellowship. At 9.45, that will end. We'll come up here, and our, sun, our Easter Sunday worship service will begin at 10 o'clock, not 11. 10 o'clock, not 11. So please mark that on your calendars. If you aren't going to come for the other things, be here for the uh, worship service at 10 o'clock on Easter Sunday. The reason for that is Airy D, where we want to have our potluck picnic after the service, is a little bit busy that day, so we got to get in a little earlier so we can get out a little earlier to make room for the folks who have it reserved right after us. So we look forward to seeing you then. And the potluck picnic, I understand there's a way online you can kind of sign up for what you want to bring, and you know that helps if you'll kind of chime in and tell us what you're planning on cooking so everybody doesn't bring the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and if you have questions about what to bring, see your friendly local pastor. I'll give you some good hints as to what to bring to the potluck. <laughs> I, I got a whole list of good stuff I just really love, and I'll tell you about all that. <laughs> so see me. All right, uh, right now I want you to join me in prayer. Uh, we worship the Lord through prayer, and I want you to join your hearts with me as we pray, and uh, then we have some other wonderful things we'll do this morning. Father in heaven, how thankful we are for every opportunity we have to come into your house, to sit before the pulpit and to be fed from your word, to sing your praises, to fellowship with one another, to encourage one another. We thank you for the joy of attending church in freedom. Father, we know that around the world today we have brothers and sisters in Christ who do not have this privilege. Many of them will go out to worship today. They'll be threatened. They may be arrested. They may be attacked, beaten, knifed. Uh, some may even be beheaded before this very Lord's day is over. We pray for those brothers and sisters that you give them strength to endure that you would even lessen their suffering. But, Lord, if you choose not to do that, may their faith hold strong. And may those who persecute them see that Jesus is worth suffering for. We just pray for those people. I pray especially for Pastor Saeed, who's still in prison in Iran, and for the good doctor in Pakistan who helped uh, our government get Osama bin Laden. Those are in prison. They need to be set free, Lord. And I pray you'll work somehow through governments or whatever you want to choose to get those men out of prison so they may return to their families. Lord, we have people here in our church who have their own physical ailments, a couple of people with back problems. Other, this is a cold and flu season and a serious allergy time. So we just ask you to look over all of our people, keep them all strong and well, and let them move forward, Lord, doing the things you give us all to do. We have many who are deployed. We ask you to look over them today, not only our church members, but all of our service men and women who are deployed, that you keep them safe, make their mission successful. Use them, Lord, to bring some kind of sense out of the chaos that's going on in the world around us. And, Lord, through them, get victory for your own self and glory for your wonderful name. 
Lord, here today, we just open our hearts and minds to you and say, come, touch us, meet our needs, make the changes in us you know that we need to make. Help us, Lord, to surrender ourselves completely to your holy will. We know, Lord, that our desires are important. They, we always have our own ideas, but there's nothing more important than your will for our lives. So we want to be right in the center of that will. We pray you take us there today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up, shake hands with the people around you, and uh, make everybody feel welcome here at Avion Baptist Church. That, that video is up if you want to use it. Okay. Pay fat when you come back home. All right, order in the court, recess is over. <laughs> Please return to your seats. We have a little promotional video we want to show you. From time to time, you hear us around here talking about FBI, Faith Bible Institute. They're going full bore in their spring semester right now, and it's already time to start registering for the fall semester. I want you to know what Faith Bible Institute is all about, so we have a short promotional video we're going to show you just now. Please watch, and then if you have questions, see me, see Dennis Pierman, see Linda. When Linda's here, she uses this right over there. We have people here who are graduates of FBI, Faith Bible Institute, and so glad that we took the course. So please watch this video and pray about what the Lord would have you do about studying God's holy word through FBI. Hi, my name is John Yates. I'm the founder and president of Faith Bible Institute and the pastor of the Roland Road Baptist Church. And I'd like to invite you to consider joining with tens of thousands of Christians in hundreds of churches around the world for an incredible, life-changing journey through the Bible, the world's most exciting book. Three Faith Bible Institute is a unique three-year chronological journey as well as a every book of the Bible, all the as well as a systematic the journey faith, through all the major teachings of the Christian faith, and a topical, journey through, exciting elective and a topical courses journey through Bible exciting prophecy, elective angels, like personal Bible evangelism, prophecy, biblical angels, creation, personal evangelism, and more. biblical creation, Faith Bible Institute and is more. designed to take Faith Bible every Institute member is designed to take every on a journey through every church on a journey through every word of the Bible. If you happen to live close enough to our main campus, sign all you have to right do here. is enroll but and for those sign of you up right here. Everywhere else but in the world, for those of you living like everywhere else in the world, we would like to help church Bible establish a local church Bible institute in your, in your own in church to train your all members no in the Word of God. To your church. All at with no, no cost demands to your church. On busy with no time demands on busy pastors. Just pastors. Just one evening in classes week. that meet in order just one evening each week in order to fit into even the busiest and most hectic schedules. All you need is a television and more people and DVD who love the player. Bible and want Ten or to more know more about it. Who love the and Bible one volunteer and want to know to more about it. And, and one volunteer to mail materials back and forth. We provide everything else, over including the teacher and over 300 life-changing lessons, life lessons on DVD. Each week at Faith Here's Bible how it works. Institute's main campus, Each week at Faith we Bible record Institute's classes main campus, in our state-of-the-art we record studio classes with a live student body, and then send those DVDs to churches around the world. And then send those DVDs to churches around the world. We also provide all the textbooks, including hundreds and thousands of fill-in-the-blank notebooks as well as students go through in class, as well as the textbooks. All included which, by the way, in your tuition cost, than a tenth which, by the way, the is less than a tenth Bible of the tuition in fact, at the average we've had Bible many college. In fact, by we've had many students sign up by saying that I was going to enroll somewhere, somewhere else, but I realized that, program realized that your entire three-year program was less than one class where I was planning on attending. Your attending. Church we'd having like to see your church have their lives members have their lives changed by the power of the Word of God. Pastors, would you like to see? Would you like to see 
teachers trained in the Bible? Would you like to see Sunday school teachers and church workers and soul winners trained in the Word of God? Would you like to see stronger families, new Christians growing in their faith, long-term believers finally growing in their faith? We hope you'll consider becoming part of Faith Bible Institute's growing We hope you'll consider becoming part of Faith Bible Institute's growing family. This is also no instead as the classes meet in your church. Classes then the fellowship in your and encouragement church, of other then students the fellowship becomes a and vital part of the learning process. Becomes a vital part One pastor of the learning called process. us and said, I want to start Faith Bible Institute in my church. Because one of my members keeps coming to church bragging about how that many of the women in his office were trained in the Word of God. Because one of my members keeps coming to church bragging about how that many of the women in his office are coming to work every day bragging about how this Bible class their husbands are taking is making them better husbands, better fathers. Christians. Better something men that and better lives Christians. That much, something that changes lives members. that much. Pastors, I want if you'd like members. to see that kind Pastors, of life change in your like church, we hope you'll take a minute to click on the link or to call us 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 to call us or 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 you will do the same thing. You may say, well, you know, I don't have six semesters. Okay, take one semester. When you get to your next church, you'll already know more Bible probably than the pastor who's going to be in the pulpit at that church. And then you can get excited. See, a lady came here from Misawa, Japan, back about 2006. She had three semesters under her belt. She wasn't about to let it get away. Preacher, you've got to start this thing. And she would not let up until I started it. I'm so glad I did. I was among the first class to graduate here at Aviana Baptist. So see us about Faith Bible Institute. The cost is very affordable. The time you spend is definitely worth it. You'll never be sorry you took that class. Okay, right now we turn it over to the music team. Let's have a great time in God's house today. Actually, if you look at the screen really quick, uh, if you haven't been downstairs yet to see the work that was transformed and what happened down there for the satellite sanctuary, that's a before picture of what it looked like, uh, painted kind of wacky where the youth had done that many years ago. And then, Amanda, if you go to the next one, that's what it looks like now. So that was uh, the work that Thomas did downstairs. So when you have a chance, thank, thank him for what he did. Let's stand together. Uh, Psalm 96, a song of praise to God coming in judgment. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. We all know the story How our Savior died on a cross on Calvary, it is finished, he cried. He hung his head and he was dead. They took him down, put him in the ground. But if that's the end of the story, then our preaching is in vain. He got up in the morning. When it seems the story's over and all hope is dead, hallelujah, he got up, he got up. Like he 
Then he made a green stem, gave it leaves, and then gave it sunshine and rain and sheltered it with moss. He grew the tree. Nothing took his life with love he gave him. He was crucified on a tree that he created with great love for man. God stayed with his plan. He So that we might go free With tears in his eyes God looked down through time Saw him spat upon, rejected And he mourned But still he the tree all oh, that he knew would be used to make the old rugged cross nothing took his life with love he gave him he was crucified God stayed with his plan. He grew the tree so that we might go free. Sing this. learn to love Jesus more, to lead more to love Jesus. That purpose statement puts a challenge on me as the pastor preacher here. How can I help you learn to love Jesus more? There's no season of the year that gives us a better opportunity to get you to understand the price he paid for you, the value he put upon you than this season in which we are. And today I'm going to try and bring you a message that will help you understand what Jesus suffered because of his love for you. With the hope that you will leave here loving him more than you ever have. Now with that in mind, I've been telling people for two or three weeks now, 
bring your children, but send them up to Children's Church because you may not want them here. There are going to be some graphic details about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ included in today's sermon. So graphic, my wife threatened not to come to church today because she's heard it before, and she knows the impact it had on her. She sucked in her gut, and she's here anyway, and I, she may leave before I get done. I don't know. She may come up here and tackle me and throw me off the platform. I don't know. Uh, Amanda, do we have enough workers to take all the kids? Well, ages three through kindergarten can go upstairs. Moms and dads, if you have children in your first grade and up, and you don't want them to be here to hear what this is, we need a volunteer or two to go upstairs. A couple of teenage young ladies are able to take the older children. If you have some materials, you can give them to help them. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Okay, children through third grade can go. And if you have children, fourth, fifth grade, who are sensitive, and you don't want them to hear a graphic description of the physical damage Jesus suffered, send them on upstairs. You're, you're free to do that. I, I want you to do what's right for your family here today. I'm going to try to do what's right for the Lord Jesus and for you, but you want your children to go up? Ah, it fell off. Okay, is that working? Okay. I knocked it off. I'm sorry. I... Okay. Jesus, throughout his brief sojourn on earth, told those who walked with him that all prophecy must be fulfilled, and specifically that all prophecy dealing with him, his life, his ministry, his end, had to be fulfilled. And he brought that to fruition. There are still some yet having to do with the second coming. We're awaiting for the fulfillment, but hundreds and hundreds of prophecies concerning Jesus Christ have already been fulfilled. Today for our text, we're going to go into Isaiah chapter 53 and look at one of the prophecies that was fulfilled there on what people nowadays call Good Friday. It was good for us, and it was good for Jesus, but maybe when you hear the description of what happened, you'll wonder how could he call it good. <laughs> Jesus suffered immensely. And we want to use this text. Now I want to say something here. In the not too distant past I sat at dinner with some of our church members and a fellow pastor from here in the local area and I heard him telling the people from our church that Isaiah chapter 53 was added to the manuscript some 200 years after Jesus left the earth. Baloney. Baloney. That is not true. You go into Acts chapter 8 and you see that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah 53 when Philip came and joined him in his chariot. And that could have been somewhere around 50 to 60 years after Jesus left. So if you run into those liberal theologians and say, well, you can't really trust Isaiah 53. It wasn't part of the original text. Tell them what I just told you. Baloney. You can say it as emphatically as you choose. It is the single best description of what happened to Jesus on the day that he died for your sins and mine. We're going to look at it in detail. We're going to start actually back in the last three verses of chapter 52 to kind of set the stage and get you to see. Now, I have this again in a joint reading kind of a thing. Uh, so I'm going to be reading a verse and you read a verse. And yours is underlined so you don't have a problem with it. And uh, we'll just go through it. I'll read mine, then I'll point and you read yours, okay? And I'm doing this because I really fear sometimes that many Christians will go through this season, never pick up a Bible and read what it says about what Jesus has done for us. So I'm trying to get you into reading the Bible. So you follow, read your part. Isaiah 52, beginning at verse 13. Behold my servant, notice the capitals, that's Jesus, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Now Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed?
He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Father in heaven, as we approach this awesome passage of Scripture today, I pray that your power from heaven will come down to work here among us. There's not one thing I can do from this pulpit that will make this passage real to the people who sit before me. But your Holy Spirit working in their hearts and lives can take it right home where it belongs, deep in their hearts. And they may, Lord, they may leave here today with a deeper appreciation of your love for them, what Jesus did for them on that old rugged cross. Open our hearts and minds now to receive what you have. Make it plain to us. And help us, Lord, be inspired to do better in our service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a very highly educated intellectual, a very wise man from Jerusalem who comes here from time to time to visit one of our church members who is now in the States. The last time he was here, uh, we sat at dinner uh, after church one Sunday and discussed Isaiah 53. And I listened to him go into great high falutin descriptions of how that is not about Jesus Christ. And he had this real lengthy explanation. It's all about something else. Yet when we ask him to tell us something else that fulfills the things written here, he had no answers. But he just did everything in his power as a, now, he is now a fallen from grace Jew. He's no longer a practicing Jew. Uh, he was trained actually to be a rabbi and he fell by the wayside. And uh, that, that's when I say he's highly educated, that's what I'm talking about. It's not about Jesus. It's about something else. Well, tell me what it's about. Who, who fulfilled the things written here if it wasn't Jesus Christ? He had no answer. Again, I say to him, baloney. <laughs> this is all about Jesus Christ. Written some 700 years prior to the event, here is God's description of what his son was going to endure because you and I as sinners desperately needed a Savior. And because God's love would not prevent him from providing us a Savior, he had to do it because he loved us that much. Now, in the world of business, there's this term. It's called uh, cost versus benefit analysis. You know, before someone invests a bunch of money and somebody look at it, is it going to pay off? They kind of weigh the pros and cons and try to get a good idea. Is it going to pay off? Well, I think Jesus did a cost and benefit analysis before he went to the cross. And that's what we're going to be kind of looking at today. You, you've heard it, and you, you physical buffed up dudes, you've heard the old thing, no pain, no gain. Uh, that may not apply as much to us as it did to Jesus. Certainly in his case, no pain, no gain. And he went to the cross, he endured the pain and the shame because there was a gain in it for him. We're going to see both those things. First of all, the pain. 
Just focus for a moment on some of the things that our passage says. It says back there in chapter 52, his visage was marred more than any man. And it says on down in the next chapter that we looked upon him, but he was not recognizable. We couldn't tell who he was. Isaiah 50, verse 6, goes back and again talk about Jesus. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Again, some 700 years before the event, it was prophesied they would spit upon him. The thing about the hair is being plucked from his face. The Gospels give us accounts of what they did to him, the beatings that he suffered at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Now, I want you to understand, you... Uh, Air Force guys who go through PT, you're most of you in real good shape, you're strong, you're he-men, uh, but you may not be anything at all compared to a Roman soldier. Uh, they didn't have uh, easy equipment to exercise on. They did things the hard way. Uh, there's a, a series of, of shows being uh, put on uh, Sky Satellite now on one of the History Channels about being trained to kill, and it, it, it shows graphic episodes of, of Roman soldiers being trained to do what they did best. Oh my goodness, the rigors and the, the benefit that came from these were strong, muscular, violent men. And they had him arrested and they had him surrounded and they did things to him. Uh, he, he has no form or company, it says in verse 2 of chapter 8. When we see them, there's no beauty we should desire him. In Matthew 26, 67, and 68, they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy out of us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Mark 14, 65, Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, to say to him, Prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Luke 22, 63, 63, Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? Now, have you ever been in a little punch out with somebody you had a disagreement with and you got struck on the face with a good solid fist? Did it leave a mark? Did it make a bruise? Did it kind of change the way you look for a little while? I've had my bloody noses and black eyes. I've, I'll tell you about that. It doesn't take much from, the, from a, a full grown man striking your face to change what you look like. But this was not a man punching him once. This was a group of men he men, the strongest, most physical men of their day, pounding him in the face with their fist. And then later, striking him with the palm of their hands. One of those Greek words used there in those gospel passages actually has to do with hitting him with a rod. They had sticks in their hands they were pounding him with. They were beating on the face and head of the Lord Jesus Christ mercilessly. And that verse in Isaiah 50 says they plucked the hairs from his beard. Many years ago, I heard a really great, highly educated Greek scholar talk about one of those words used in those Gospels literally describes slamming your hand against his face, grabbing a handful of hair, and as you withdraw your hand, you pull the handful of hair with it. And that preacher, without apologizing the way I have done, went ahead to describe that, you know, it hurts really badly if you pluck one hair from your face. You ladies know more about that than we guys do, I suppose. But if you get a handful, they're not going to just come out by the roots. When they come away, they're going to tear the skin and the underlying flesh in which they're rooted is going to come away. So when it says he was, his face was marred like no man, he was uncomely, there was nothing beautiful about him. This man was mutilated by those hands that pounded and pounded and pounded on him. And then there was those things there, commonly known as cat of nine tails, a whip with nine strands. In the ends of those strands had been tied pieces of bone, rock, or metal. And they tied the prisoner in this way, and they stood off to the side, and they lashed it across his back. Now, I found some graphic stuff as I was looking for these slides. I, did, I left it at home. You're going to praise God I did because it's really gross. But I want to tell you this. Back in about 1969, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 1989, 1990, we were in Tennessee, and someone published a study that had been done by forensic doctors trying to learn what did the body of Jesus Christ endure. 
They went to a prison, and this is a sad set of circumstances. They went to a prison, and there were cadavers there of people who had died, and no one had come to claim the bodies. So they took them. They got permission to take them, and they took them, and they propped them up, and they tied them to posts, and they took cat of nine tails, and they weighed in on those bodies to see what damage would it do. They learned that when a strong, strong man takes that thing and leans into it that way, It'll strike the back, but the ends will wrap around the torso. Then they'll pull it back for their next wing, and as they do, the sharp objects on the end will slice through the flesh. So not only did the back of his body get beaten to shreds, but the front of his body was beaten to shreds as well. And they learned that if you do that as often as the Roman authorities did, before you're finished, there will be parts of the inner body extending out through gashes in the body. You know, I wonder how Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, could have stumbled when they put the cross beam on his shoulders and told him to carry it to Calvary. He fell and someone had to come and pick it up. Listen, you and I have no idea the physical torture that man was subjected to. It's worse than anything you can ever imagine. I've had a recent experience, and a guy who did this here in the... Uh, church today. I thank him because he did a good job. I had a little cyst removed from my back. A little space about an inch. Just one little cyst. For three weeks I've been in torment. It was nasty for several days. And then it got well. It still hurts. If I lean onto it, I still feel pain. One little old thing about like that and I, I just hate it. It was awful. And I can't imagine what happened to Jesus on that day. The pain, the pain. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. You have to understand that before any of this physical torture began to happen, he saw those men who were closest to him in the Garden of Gethsemane turn and run from him for their lives. They were cowards and they fled they ran away. He was rejected by his own closest followers. He already had a heartache over that. And then here are these people whom he came from heaven to save who are pounding him and beating him and tearing his body up like chopped meat, bearing our griefs and carrying our sorrows, oppressed, afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. He opened not his mouth. Peter writes about that in his first epistle, chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. What do you want to do first when someone hurts you? When something unjust happens to you? When something inside you cries out for justice, make them pay. They can't get away with that. It was awful. No one ever had more reason to complain than Jesus Christ, and yet the passage says he did not say a word. He trusted everything that was happening to him into the hands of the one who judges righteously, his Father in heaven. Paul caught that theme, and in 1 Corinthians 4.12, he wrote about you and me. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. You have trouble blessing people who are hurting you? Jesus didn't have any trouble. He did it. John Piper has a little book, 31-day devotional. I found it in our church library, by the way. I took it home because uh, I love John Piper and everything he writes that I've ever seen was good. Uh, on day 16 of his little 31-day meditation, he wrote these words, and pardon me for reading, but I, I, I sat and kind of rehearsed how I could paraphrase it, and there's nothing I can do that will make it sound as good as he did. You know, he's a great man of God, a great writer, and he probably spent hours getting these words in the right order. There's nothing I can do to improve them, so I'm going to read them to you. He's talking about when, you get, when you're tempted to sin. He's talking specifically about uh, sexual lust, but any other temptation. He says when the temptation hits, you've got five seconds to react. 
And he says, what you do is you try to picture Jesus on the cross. And here's what he says. Use all your fantasizing power to see his lacerated back. Thirty-nine lashes left, little flesh intact. He heaves with his breath up and down against the rough vertical beam of the cross. Each breath puts splinters into the lacerations. The Lord gasps. From time to time he screams out with intolerable pain. He tries to pull away from the wood and the massive spokes through his wrist rip into the nerve endings and he screams again with agony and pushes up with his feet to give some relief to his wrist. But the bones and nerves in his pierced feet crush against each other with anguish and he screams again. There is no relief. His throat is raw from screaming and thirst. He loses his breath and thinks he is suffocating. And suddenly his body involuntarily gasps for air and all the injuries unite in pain, in torment. He forgets about the crown of two-inch thorns and throws his head back in desperation only to hit one of the thorns perpendicular against the cross beam and drive it half an inch into his skull. His voice reaches a soprano pitch of pain and sobs break over. His pain-wracked body as ever... And, and, and sobs break over his pain, racked body as every cry brings more and more pain. Visiting over at Rota, Spain a few years ago, out in the town just going around, we came across a thorn bush. I have pictures of the crown here somewhere. That thorn bush had spines on it, thorns that long. I was with a man from a Baptist church there in Rota, and I stopped and I looked at that and I said, Hey, I wonder if those are the kind of thorn bushes that grow in Israel. He said, Oh, yes, I've been there, I've seen them. I wonder, is that what they made the crown of thorns from? He said, Oh, yes. You can bet it was that. I don't know how how much you like pain, but you understand, although he was fully God, he was also fully man. He had a nerve ending everywhere. You and I have a nerve ending. He felt every sensation just as you and I would feel every sensation. And the agony of it would have been enough to make any of us stop before it ended. But not him. Not him. And here as I study the Bible and study this event... I'm always impressed by the fact that what I've just described to you is not what Jesus dreaded on that day. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane asking his father to take that cup from him, it was not the beating, the torture, the pounding, the thorns. That's not what he wanted to avoid. He wanted to avoid having our sins dumped upon him. That's what he wanted to escape. In Hebrews 12, 2, when the author says, looking unto Jesus, the author finished for our faith, endured the cross, despising the shame. It wasn't the pain that he despised. He despised the shame of having our sins cast upon him. You know, to be Christ-like, means to hate sin. To be a Christ follower means to hate sin. Yes, all the sin that goes on around you, but much more importantly, all the sin that goes on within you. And it does. It happens to all of us. The pain. He was taken from prison from judgment. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. There was a gain. There was a gain. And as much as I hate preaching what I just preached, I love preaching what comes next. Verse 5 of chapter 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now listen to what verse 10 says. There are some verses of Scripture that just blow my mind every time I come across them. As many times as I read them, I still am just completely blown away when I read Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure 
of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Lord Jesus, the pain. Oh my goodness, we can't even imagine the pain. What was the gain? Why did you do it, Jesus? Ah, oh, because I can look down through the annals of history and I can see everyone, every broken-hearted, trembling, helpless, and hopeless sinner who's going to run to the foot of my cross, repenting of their sins, trusting into that blood, in that blood that I have shed, and be redeemed of their sins, be given a new life, be given a home in heaven with me. I can see them out there in the future. I can see the work of my soul, and I am satisfied with what's going to happen because of my pain. I know sometimes the circumstances of life can make people feel valueless, worthless, unimportant, insignificant. Circumstances can beat us down. Oh, my goodness. Whenever that happens, think about Isaiah 53. Think about the things you heard here in this church this morning. Say, you know, if Jesus found me that valuable, if Jesus found me that important, if Jesus desired me enough to endure that pain for me, I am worth a lot more than anybody on this earth can ever know. That's why he did it. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul, be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What's the gain, Lord? Oh, I'm going to have a gathering of souls in heaven with me one day. People whose sins have been washed away by my shed blood. People who have been healed by my stripes, by my suffering. Whose souls have been repaired and made whole again in me. That is the gain for which I'm looking. Hebrews 2.10 for it was fitting for him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. To bring many sons to glory. Now you have to stop and think about this just a moment. Who were we before he brought us to glory? We were sinners, vile, evil, corrupted, polluted, contaminated, whatever word you want to use, we were filthy in our sins. And yet he has brought us to glory. You have to go back and maybe read John 17. There are plenty of other places. What glory? He brought you into his very own glory. The glory he had with the Father before time ever was. He brought us to glory. Jesus again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus, the second or third time that cat of nine tails wrapped around my body, I would have said, they better find some other way. I can't do this. But you didn't do that. By the time they drove that first spike through my hand, I would have said, there has to be some other way. I can't do this. But you didn't stop. You, Jesus, went all the way so that one day you could call me your child. My, how you must have loved us. In the last verse of our chapter, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Do you understand that until that moment when he hung there on the cross, Jesus' life had never been touched by sin? He had seen it. He knew certainly what it was. He had never been touched by even the smallest, seemingly most innocent of sins. And then all of a sudden, all the vile, filthy, rotten, contemptible sins of all the human race were dumped upon his sinlessly perfect body. He was numbered with us as a transgressor. 
hard to understand. Yet it's the reality of what happened. Why did he do it? Because he loved us so much. We go through a text like this and we read it as literature. And it's powerful as literature. But it's not until we stop and actually consider this was a real person. It was a real physical body. And that was real damage being done to that physical body. And that physical body felt every sensation just as mine would. You begin to understand God's love for me is greater than I have ever, ever, ever imagined. For him to endure all that, keep his mouth shut. You know, he could have just blinked an eye and all the forces of heaven would have come down on Calvary that day and destroyed all his enemies, left him standing there victorious. He didn't do that. He couldn't pay for our sins had he done that. He had to go all the way. And he did. And he did. Romans 5.19 for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. In John chapter 10, Jesus says he laid down his life, he took it up again because he had received that command from his Father. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All that suffering, all that pain, because he looked down through the annals of time and saw you and me embracing him and being forgiven for our sins, we are the gain for which he suffered the pain. If you're here today and you've embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've repented of your sins, you've trusted him, you are why Isaiah 53 was fulfilled on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the reason for Calvary. You are the reason for Easter. You are the gain that he weighed when he considered the pain. You're the benefit that he saw when he counted the cost, what he was going to have to do. I think that makes him a Jesus worth loving more. And I really feel like it makes him a Jesus worth leading more to love. You have a story to tell. The people around you maybe don't want to hear it. They may get mad at you. They may say something insulting. They might even punch you in the nose. I don't know. They aren't going to do anything to you like what we did to Jesus when he hung on that cross. So try to lead more people to love the Jesus who loves you. Pray with me, please. Father, I never, ever feel adequate to deal with a passage of Scripture like this, with a subject like this. I never feel sufficient. I certainly never feel worthy. But Lord, what I want you to do now is just let your voice speak to the hearts of the people sitting here today. Lord, I want every believer here to learn to love Jesus more than they've ever loved him in the past. I want the unbelievers to be led through the power of your word and the work of your Holy Spirit to embrace him and to begin loving him right now, to walk out of here with him embedded in their hearts as personal Lord and Savior. That's what I want and that's what I pray for. No way to do the passage justice, but your Holy Spirit can work above my deficiencies and inadequacies, Lord, and speak to people's hearts. May they do during these next few minutes exactly what you, their Father, wants them to do. And we'll rejoice with them in the victories that come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never repented of your sins, you don't even know what it means, step forward and tell me. We'll have a meeting after church. I'll explain it to you. You can leave here today a born-again child of God. You may be a Christian who somehow slipped away. You haven't been living a life worthy of what Jesus paid for you on the cross. Come and just kneel here and do business with Him. Rededicate your life to Jesus Christ today and then walk out of here committed to living better than you have in the past. Any other thing on your heart, church membership, special prayer request, bring them to the front as we sing this song. You sing, I'm here waiting for you, and I'll minister to you any way I can. You please come.
Thank you all so very, very much for being here today and for your attendance, uh, your attendance and your attention to the message. I pray that you've learned something today that will help you love Jesus more. Right now you're going to sing a song to fill your hearts with gladness, have you go out here with a smile on your face, a song in your heart. Remember, God loves you. No matter what else happens in life, He still loves you, and He proved it on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I want us tonight at 5 o'clock.